Um, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, the Great Hall here in uh, King's College London and the Dixon Poon uh, School of Law. Uh, I'm Paul James Cardwell, and I'm a professor of law uh, here in the Vice Dean Education in the Law School, uh, and I'm also one of the three editors of the JCMS, uh, the Journal of Common Market um, Studies. Uh, the JCMS is the leading multidisciplinary journal devoted to the study of European integration and comparative regionalism. Uh, we're over 60 years old, we publish six uh, issues a year, as well as an annual review with articles, research notes, book reviews, and policy commentaries on all topics. Uh, we cover things including the EU institutions, external relations, political economy, competitiveness, big tech, regulation, rule of law, democracy, and uh, sustainability, and we place great emphasis on theoretical and methodological insights which challenge existing boundaries of scholarship. Our annual lecture is the highlight of the JCMS calendar. Our annual lectures allow for a greater level of reflection on major and timely topics of European integration and crucially, our way of understanding and approaching the study of Europe. Uh, in 2021, uh, Gamina Bamra delivered the lecture, A Decolonial Project for Europe. Uh, and in 2022, Catherine de Vries uh, talked about uh, how foundational narratives shape European Union politics. And our annual lectures are published as full articles in due course uh, in the journal, so you can read all about it um, later on. Um, I would like to thank uh, UACs, the, European, uh, the University Association for Contemporary European Studies and Wiley, uh, the publishers who own, uh, co-own the journal. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their support. Uh, and also we're hosted tonight uh, by the Center for European Law and its directors, uh, Professors Andrea Biondi and Takis Tridimes are here uh, tonight. Thank you very much for your um, uh, uh, hosting of this event. In choosing the topic of um, the uh, annual lecture, there was only really one subject that we wanted to cover because it is the one which is dominating our thoughts about Europe and European uh, integration. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the war in 2022 has first and foremost had a devastating effect on the lives of all of the Ukrainians who find themselves suffering daily attacks or displaced within or out with the country or on the front lines fighting for the very survival of their state. The invasion has also turbocharged the desires of the Ukrainian government and population to strive for a peaceful future within the EU and within uh, the uh, institutional framework that we know, which also has changed the perceptions of um, enlargement, uh, including towards Ukraine and uh, other states in the region. What's missing from this picture, though, is how the views of Ukrainians see the EU over a longer period of time predating uh, the war and also how Ukrainians see themselves in, within it in the future. For Belarusians too, whose large-scale protests in 2020 prominently featured the EU along state, alongside stated desires for democratic transition, their views can also tell us much about what the EU stands for. So there's no one better to talk on these topics and with authority about Ukrainians and Belarusians and what they're fighting for than our speaker for this annual lecture, Professor Olya Onuk. Professor Onuk is Professor of Comparative and Ukrainian Politics at the University of Manchester. Uh, her recent promotion to chair makes her the first chair in, polit in the politics of Ukraine in the UK. Uh, she was previously Associate Fellow in Politics at Nuffield College, Oxford. Her expertise on protest, elections, migration, and identity in Eastern Europe has made her a leading authority in East European comparative politics and interregional comparative analysis. Her most recent book, uh, with Henry E. Hale, The Zelensky Effect, was published in 2022 to rave reviews, and it looks at how ordinary citizens uh, come to develop a sense of civic duty, fostering civic-centered state attachment as opposed to an ethno-national one and how the Ukrainian president himself embodies these values in, to quote our speaker, his very ordinariness as a Ukrainian. Uh, there are copies of the book which are available um, at, the, uh, at the back of the hall. Uh, we will be followed by a uh, drinks uh, reception, uh, but first and foremost, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Olga Anush to deliver the L uh, Journal of Common Market Studies annual lecture, Fighting for Europe, Ukrainians and Belarusians Changing Vision of the EU, 
and their place within it. So I'm going to have to do this. Can you still hear me if I, yeah, okay, perfect. A little bit more, and you still hear me fine? All right. Thank you so much for those incredibly kind words. And uh, I'm still at that place uh, following my promotion when I hear the words professor of comparative and Ukrainian politics. It gives me a little, a little joy inside. It is an awkward title, but it is not only the first in the United Kingdom in Ukrainian politics, it is the first in the English speaking world. And when my auntie, Teta Olya, also has my name, heard it, she started to cry. And hearing it gets me all choked up inside. So that's why I'm already emotional before I even started talking about the difficult things. All right, let us get to the topic at hand. We listen in awe and horror as ordinary Ukrainians declare, be it on the streets in 2014 or in the steps today, that they are fighting and dying for Europe for a future in the EU. We might wonder what drives this fateful declaration and ambition. What is at its core most attractive about the EU to those outside of it? And how can this thing that is so attractive to those outside of it be used to pull neighboring countries and their citizens into the fold while also using it to protect the union itself from external and existential threats. It perhaps still remains a missing piece of the puzzle. In 2023, the success of the EU as a peace project carved out through economic and political integration can perhaps be called into question. What good is peace inside the union if, it, if its failed accession policy, its misguided international relations with authoritarian neighbors, are directly, in fact, connected to, if not the partial cause of, a major multi-year war on its borders. A war that is not only horrific for the Ukrainians it aims to destroy, but one that has, in fact, immediate economic and social consequences for EU member states and their citizens. A war with the looming possibility that is, in fact, not just a story or a scare tactic, but a looming possibility of escalation and spillover across and into the EU's borders. All of these threats jeopardize the EU's capacity to maintain member state unity, as we have seen in the last, now nearly coming on two years. By not bringing in Ukraine in sooner, coupled with perhaps what I would argue are naive uh, is naive thinking that Russia could be pacified through economic interdependence with the EU. Its cohesion, its actorness, and its economic independence are, are threatened and will continue to be so. One might propose that the future success of the EU does not simply hang on the question of its cohesive European actorness, its capacity to work in unity on trade, security, human, and political development, be it on the European continent, across the Atlantic, or globally, but rather, and perhaps even more importantly, the future success of the Union rests on its capacity to understand what, at its core, is most attractive to and has the strongest pull for those outside of it, specifically within its neighborhood, concentric circles, and those also inside of it who want to remain in. And we must ask, what drives ordinary citizens to want their country to join or stay in the EU? Why, in the case of ordinary Ukrainians, are they ready to fight and die for it? So I think an answer may be found in how ordinary citizens have themselves articulated this fight that they are in. When ordinary Ukrainians declare, be it in 2004 during the Orange Revolution, 2014 during the Euromaidan, or today during all-out war against their country, that they are fighting for Europe, they also then explain in qualitative and in qualitative forms of data collection that it is the defense, that they are also fighting for the defense of democracy and democratic values. Ordinary people 
are speaking in those very complex and rather, I think, also enlightened terms. So how, if at all, are these two calls connected? For survival, for a place in the EU, and for democracy. And how might analyzing them in unison help us understand the EU's true core pull factor? Whilst past scholarship has highlighted value-based dispositions as key drivers of EU support, it has also really focused on, in the broad majority of scholarship, without naming the incredible uh, the multitude of, of incredible scholars that have contributed to this, um, predominantly there has been a bias towards materialist or economic focus factors. So it, it's understood that socioeconomic push factors, deprivation at home, or pull factors, material improvement ones in the union, came to dominate a lot of the explanations of what uh, is attractive within the EU. But also within the EU, uh, scholars noted that economic crises were also breeding populists who weakened democracy, that economic stability was thus not uh, a mere pull factor for outsiders. It was also a necessary factor for holding the union together. Nonetheless, I think the discipline acknowledged also that member states often turn a blind eye to institutional illiberalism or to minority rights. Common EU democratic values turned into conditionality light for outsiders and, at worst, window dressing for those who are already in, making it quite quaint to talk about liberal democratic values as pull factors. It may have been part of this exact discourse. Uh, it was there, but it was not perceived by scholars over time to be the primary driving element in the calculi to join in. So, was something overlooked? What if it was precisely the growing import of liberal democratic values that drove Ukrainians or Belarusians, or others, to support EU accession? What if this was also the main driver for those already in the Union of wanting to stay in? Today I will put to you that Ukrainians and Belarusians protested, fought, died for their place in Europe, simultaneously also rejecting Russia's economic stability model in the pursuit of their place in the EU and part of the democratic pull that the EU had. Because uh, as comparativists, we are often hesitant to accept findings from one or two cases, especially ones that have seen a significant democratization, such as Ukraine or multiple mass mobilizations or a significant mass mobilization in recent years like Belarus. Uh, today, I will explore this pattern also in other EU neighboring countries, such as Morocco, where providing leverage and Morocco provides us with leverage and variation on both regime type, on the likelihood of democratic transition, and on the probability of a future in the EU as full member. But I'll also take a look at this pattern uh, and how well it travels to citizens of member states such as those in countries that have recently experienced some backsliding and where we have seen a rise of some Euroscepticism, such as Poland. So the argument is, I'll say it right away and then we'll get to it and we'll see if you are with me on it. It is the so-called, and admittedly often idealized, European liberal and democratic values that at the core that are, sorry, at the core of EU discourse and ethos that have pulled citizens in neighboring non-democracies closer to democratic preferences and disposition. In turn, this has propelled forward democratization processes at home in their countries through their engagement in politics. Moreover, this EU democratic pull phenomenon is not only important for neighbors, 
but I believe it is also a key driver of wanting to stay in the union within member states. And this is two sides of uh, one story, two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, I think we need a theoretical and empirical correction to some of the ways we looked at micro-level foundations of the desire to join or stay in the union. On the other hand, this is also a story of EU policymakers and analysts and their willingness to repeatedly overlook such developments in these countries. Because it is convenient to overlook this pattern and this development, because not overlooking it, admitting it, and having to deal with it not only means you have to deal with potential EU expansion, which is costly and difficult, but because it would also require them to rethink their pragmatic approaches to and relationships with other authoritarian neighbors, those close authoritarian neighbors, <coughs> and namely Russia. I do think that the EU's hesitancy when it came to bringing some countries into the fold was linked also to misjudgments, specifically elite misjudgments, around cooperative economic relationships with authoritarian regimes. So, mise en scène, master narratives and narrative mistakes in context, bringing back uh, Catherine's uh, speech last year. I think in her analysis of foundational narratives of the EU, she convincingly argued that European contemporaries, and I quote here, need to uncover blind spots whilst also acknowledge that foundational narratives are strategically manipulated by elites in order to foster support for their actions. Even in the face of a clear existential crisis, we see that divisions within the union permeate the perimeter of collective action. She also noted that not only does this crisis affected lack of unity in some moments call into question the first two narratives, which are integration and unity for peace through crisis, but it also underlines the weakness of the second two, that economic interdependence and the rule of law can pave a way for peace within the union as well as between the union and its neighbors. And I think this is an issue of mistaken identity. Justifications for a pragmatic and inclusive, <clears throat> as opposed to a punishing uh, relationship with an autocratic neighbor of Russia, was often couched in the language of the second two narratives. It was a strategy that failed to comprehend that by virtue of its authoritarianism, Russia would always see the EU as its direct competitor. The competition was for economic and political influence, be it in the shared regional neighborhood or in the global south or elsewhere. And this comp competitive strategy would persist, all while keeping the EU dependent on Russian energy resources. Today, the EU, some might have said once hopeful, perhaps realizing naive, strategy, enabled uh, an inability, sorry, to see Russia for what it was, a hostile competitor to the EU, left it not only economically vulnerable, but also faced with the real threat of hot war spilling over into its territory. So perhaps another foundational narrative central to EU ethos was perhaps missing from Catherine's critique. Perhaps the missing ingredient is this narrative of the binding, binding, deepening nature of common European liberal democratic values. Interestingly, whilst this narrative became the master frame for repeated waves of enlargement, not least in 2004 onwards, the fundamental logic of the key, a litmus test for accession and the process, and repeatedly declared as the EU's strength vis-a-vis -vis other global actors, it obviously has become very difficult to live up to it even within the Union. In the face of multiple crises, it becomes secondary to immediate matters related to economic competitiveness or quite frankly survival. And this is a challenge. Compounding matters 
the EU was directly and repeatedly challenged by autocratic competitors. Not only Russia, but specifically Russia. And these autocratic competitors were able to seek economic stability whilst not having to preoccupy themselves with the messiness of political liberalism and pluralism. And whilst pursuing policies that allowed for some economic development and or maybe at points in time stability, were also able to ensure that energy resources were increasingly gonna be unreliable, were increasingly gonna come under threat due to, in fact, their authoritarian manipulations of the energy market and their provision of it, specifically gas in the case of the EU. And, and for some reason, when it became clear that Putin's Russia was willing to hold these economies within the EU or the EU economy as a whole hostage, few were ready to challenge the Russian bear for fear of breaking union cohesion. And we all know that this is not necessarily a new member cohesion phenomenon, but an old and new member cohesion phenomenon. And so this is a question, I think, of a bad hand and a bad bluff. In the face of repeated economic crisis, the fear of Brexit, the realities of Brexit, the rise of right-wing populism, feeling more fragile than ever, the EU doubles down. EU leaders were ready to make the trade-off, hoping economic and energy security would at least prevent further disintegration of the EU. I think the EU was pressured economically, but also through in Russian information warfare that was directly targeting its member state citizens to destabilize democracy within the EU. As time went on, scholars also lamented any normative power of the EU, it was thought the EU no longer has this. It no longer has this within its neighborhood, and any hopes of it remaining started to cave in. And there comes a critical inflection point. Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine in 2022 provoked EU inward examination like we haven't seen, I think, in many years. It crystallized the fact that policies prioritizing economic cooperation would in fact never bring competing authoritarian states into the fold. Any cooperation with or dependency on these states would only further expose the EU to economic and security threats. So let's go back to what we have said in the literature, in the scholarly literature. What drives ordinary citizens to want their country to join or stay the EU? Well, you have the economic or materialist experiences hypothesis, and I'm calling it that for now. We can talk about it if it should be called that later. And the, the, the hypothesis, as we all know it, uh, is that for those outside of the EU, economic experience hypo the economic experiences hypothesis is connected to an instrumentalist viewpoint. It is centered on the notion that individuals' expectations of socioeconomic gains resulting from closer ties with or entry into the EU are pull factors, as I already said. And it is also perceived that citizens' own evaluation of and perception of deprivation at home becomes a factor that pushes them to join the EU. And then you have this push-pull dynamic. On the other hand, for those already in the EU, this hypothesis might argue or might focus on the elements that include the perceived penalties or unfairness, socioeconomically speaking, for being in the EU or its common market. That certain constituencies, certain types of citizens might evaluate that there are in fact economic drawbacks of being in the EU or economic unfairness. Broadly speaking, the, the, the competing theory here would be the normative political values and ambition hypotheses. Very different tones, very different levels. We're almost talking about different universes, in fact. And here, the, the scholarly arguments and the theory would say that pro-European orientations are in fact rooted in common political values, coupling the EU's political democratic exemplification, position, and influence with ambitions to be like it or its member states. Uh, here, there would be an emphasizing of the perceived democratic advantages of embracing a European identity not 
not simply a, a European Union identity, but a European identity, and benefiting, that would benefit the country, a certain country's future, and also the citizens of that country would have social, political, and economic well-being for embracing this. And this is obviously tied to this myth or notion that the EU is perceived to be a historical leader of regional liberal democracy, and that it will be, in fact, capable of attracting Democrats, and then it will repel those who hold autocratic positions. But why would ordinary citizens see the EU by these lights? And how is this all connected to the context of existential threat posed by Russia? How do the above, well, not the above, the, the previously stated two hypotheses overlap with this geopolitical push and pull as well? I think this is because we're also faced with, in fact, two competing models of systems of state governance. One is the economic stability model, in fact, the autocratic economic stability model. This could be Russia, this could be also China, this could be other states. Here, on the one hand, let's call it Russia, it, competing for influence has transmitted a certain model of economic stability. And in fact, Putin does this regularly in his speeches, as do many uh, top rank within the Kremlin. And it sort of worked for a period of time. The middle class was growing in size. Medium voters' lives were slightly improving, specifically in urban centers. And I think Bryn Rosenfeld wrote an excellent paper just on how this changes state-citizen relationships. Citizens, it seems, highly educated, middle class, urban citizens, were willing to <coughs> accept the trade off between chaos of the early 1990s and the growing stability and also their, their personal economic welfare. And of course, in discourses and in perceptions, this is not only juxtaposed to the chaos of the 1990s, but also to the increasing relative or perceived economic instability within the Eurozone, within the EU. Over the same period, for instance, where the Russian middle class is growing, is becoming more comfortable, and the situation is becoming more stable for ordinary Russian citizens, the EU looks a little bit like a basket case economically. It may or may not be the EU's problem, in fact, it may not even be quite true comparatively. <coughs> but that perception is put out to the neighboring countries in those concentric circles. The model becomes increasingly attractive not only to those who believe that transitions to democracy led to instability and security, but also obviously to those who have conservative views culturally and about strongman rule. On the other hand, when we seriously revisit the EU's normative democratic power as an albeit idealized historical node of liberal democracy, we can see that the EU in fact still continued to propose a serious alternative model. Of course, it wasn't only and at times really couldn't uh, be rooted itself in economic stability and certainty, but one, but a model that pulled citizens into the EU, whether within or outside of it, because it underscored that they shared or prioritized common values. It also places citizens at the center of state citizens' interactions, at least discursively. So really, we have a choice between two very different models. In other words, individuals who express support for principles of liberal democracy, we would expect uh, they would be more inclined to endorse EU accession. Conversely, those who are receptive to authoritarian tendencies, value stability, would be more likely to strengthen, uh, not only to, to want more closer ties with, the, with Russia, but also would want their countries to emulate a Russian model. Not only are these two competing models of state governance and state citizen interactions, 
but they are also about citizens' own perceptions of geopolitical belonging and threat. So here we're gonna go now to an empirical illustration of the EU's democratic poll in five scenes. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say that this data is from uh, initially two projects. One is the Mobilized Project, and it's a series of five, uh, panel surveys in uh, five countries over five years. Morocco, Poland, Argentina, Ukraine, and Belarus. And the questionnaires were proposed, um, sorry, the questionnaires were all purpose designed, and in fact, they were designed to include items on views of the EU specifically. Of course, the questionnaires allow us to ask a whole lot of things in the pandemic, and war happens in the middle of this, so we have a lot of interesting data. But what is, uh, I think, very important for those who are skeptical of these very diverse cases being in one data collection exercise, the cases were in fact selected to reflect different types of relationships with and in the EU. And then we have uh, data from the IBIF project, which is just focused, it's ongoing, and it's just focused on Ukraine specifically, where we replicate many of these questions. So first off, Ukrainians fighting for Europe. And let's see if this now works. It worked on my end. It's <laughs> not up there. There we go. Perfect. Fantastic. So let's start with Ukrainians fighting for Europe. Okay? What I want you to understand about Ukrainian national identity, it's not only that it's a civic national identity, but it is also a European one. So many Ukrainians see themselves not just as part of Europe, but as a central and integral component at the heart of Europe. And I can tell you this confidently, after 500 interviews and over 50-something focus groups conducted in the last decade. This is what Ukrainians talk about. We are at the heart of Europe. You've heard a lot of other countries say the same. Not only are they perceiving themselves to be at the heart of Europe, Simultaneously, they want to be more, or their country rather, to be more like a normal European country. So whilst they are at the heart of it, the normality is elsewhere, it seems, in the EU. So Europe isn't a destination on some meandering path, and in fact, if you do know your Ukrainian history well, you understand that the first public elite statement about wanting to join the EU was in 1993, and that was Kuchma, who was perceived to be pro-Russian in his political leaning, which was incorrect. So they always considered themselves as part of this family, but what now we have for certain is that Ukrainians have an, uh, this profound desire, not just to be part of Europe, but to be members of the EU. This strong pro-EU sentiment among Ukrainians underscores their status, uh, in fact, as staunch Atlanticists. And I'll show you some data in a second. Um, they really look to align their nation with the values and institutions of the European Union. And this has been ongoing since 2014, in fact. If anyone has been paying attention to the laws and reforms, as they have been happening in Ukraine, you would be surprised by how much of it is exactly what would be expected of a candidate country. Today, in a survey conducted in August 2023, but the last survey I got back was September 30th, so a little bit closer, 90% of the Ukrainian population want their country to join the EU. Okay. And this, perhaps you already read it as I was speaking, percent of Ukrainians agreeing that in five years time, their country's standard of living will approach that of the European Union. 59% of the Ukrainian population currently, in the midst of an all-out war, tens of billions of euros in destruction and ongoing every single day. 59% think that in five years, their standard of living will be that of the median Union. So perhaps 
like some of those European analysts and policymakers and their hopeful visions of interaction with Russia, Ukrainians are perhaps also positive and hopeful more than many analysts would themselves predict. When you ask Ukrainians about wanting to join the EU, 90% of them, and then you run analyses on what is the main driver today, today during war, during a rally effect, Right? There's a rally around the flag effect happening in Ukraine, all sorts of things happening. And when you ask them a variety of different questions, and you run, in this case, this is an OLS uh, regression, um, and here are marginal effects, and you put in the main, core, uh, the main control variables that we would all no normally put in, in the case of Ukraine, preferring a democratic system for their country, also, what we would understand in the discipline as being a Democrat is the number one predictor of wanting to join the EU today. Okay, but that's today. Uh, and how about those, uh, <laughs> those incredible, hopeful Ukrainians that think in five years' time their, living, uh, their standard of living will be like that of the EU? Well, they too are Democrats. But what do they think will actually bring them there, having voted for Zelensky or intending to vote for Zelensky. And we ran this model in both ways. So it's not that they think the EU will solve <coughs> this problem internally. They, in fact, have faith in their own political elite in the midst of a war. And that is the Zelensky effect, and of course, I've written about that. So let's look at this long-term dynamic of support for the EU, going back to the moment right before the Yevromaidan in November 2023. The exact same question, act, and here we're addressing the population differences, so to the same population over time, and uh, in the various studies that we ran. Right before the Yevromaidan, just about 40% of the population want to join the EU. There's an initial boost following the mass protests. And then there's a stabilization. But then something weird starts to happen after Zelensky is elected in 2019. You see this continual increase over time. And of course, then you have the rally around the flag following the all-out invasion. If you look at uh, support for NATO, it follows a very similar trajectory. It's ever in so increasing over time, but obviously at a lower rate than the EU, but still jumping to a rally around the flag effect, clearly. So let's go back to the future and assess support for joining the EU and Ukraine since 2013. Does this pattern hold simply in the wartime context, or is this in fact a continued predictive feature of wanting to join the EU over time? So if we look at 2019, that year when we see that first jump, the number one variable that predicted someone wanting to join the EU in 2019, it's a cross-section snapshot, was believing that democracy is the best system for their country. In fact, being a Democrat increases the likelihood that an individual wants to join the EU by 16 percentage points at the 99% significance level. And we, by the way, we run several of these models in a variety of different ways, um, and we get the same effects. But how about, because we use panel data and mobilize, how about if we look at those who went from not wanting their country to join the EU to those who came to that position between 2019 and 2021? A mere two and a bit years, if you look at the time slide. Yeah. And here, obviously, we, we only look at those people in the panel. This is 491. There are issues a little bit with some of these things. Uh, the more detail, I can give more detail. Uh, um, uh, I, I can give more details about the, the analysis. But moving also from not being a Democrat in 2019 and becoming a Democrat adjusting the model correctly, is the number one predictor of moving to a 
pro-EU accession position. In fact, it increases the likelihood, having moved to a pro, uh, having moved to a Democrat position, increases the likelihood that someone wants Ukraine to join the EU by 20 percentage points at the 99% significance level. Now let's look at this very fascinating tail end of the panel, our last survey as part of the Mobilize project right before all the all-out invasion of Ukraine by Russia ended on February 16th, 2022. We are very lucky in our project in terms of the nerdy social science side that we were able to get that snapshot right before all of it. I get shivers when I say it. All happenstance. But looking at that last year, remember this is pandemic, economic crisis, ongoing war in Ukraine, and an increasing march to war in that last wave. In that one year, becoming a Democrat increases the likelihood, in one year, increases the likelihood of also wanting to join the EU by 10 percentage points. And I have tried to find something similar in different countries, and I can't find anything of that, that much of a jump in one year in the context that was happening. But this is not just a Ukrainian phenomenon. In fact, I think this EU uh, democratic poll might be a little bit more generalized. So let's look at European-bound Moroccans. Highly unlikely, if you're going to bet on this in the next five years, next 10 years, maybe ever. But some Moroccans want to join the EU. And the story is a little bit more complicated. You have different, so you have economic drivers, like perceiving the economy being worse at home, um, not perceiving one's own personal economic situation being worse, but perceiving the economic uh, context at home being worse. And receiving remittances are also significant. But nonetheless, being a Democrat and thinking in Morocco, which is actually a very dangerous disclosure to make, thinking that a democratic system is the best one for Morocco increases the likelihood that a Moroccan will want to join the EU by 9%. Poles who want to stay in, and there are many of them, many, 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 broad majority. A lot of people are celebrating the return of democracy in Poland. Democracy never left Poland. Being a supporter of democracy in Poland increases the likelihood that a Pole wants to stay in the EU by 11 percentage points. That's it. It's, a, it's an ongoing combining the analysis, putting the data together, running more complex models in this case, uh, and, and controlling for different country effects, fixed effects, and so on. And you still find that collectively, being a Democrat increases the likelihood that an individual wants to join the EU by 13 percentage points. Where did this all start? It actually started with our analyses of Belarusians, a lot of Ukrainians. In 2020, we decided in the Mobilize project to also survey the Belarusian population. We managed to conduct an online survey during the protests, and we had a variety of technical things that we did to ensure who were, uh, to ensure the quality of the data. But it is an online survey, so that, that is an element here. Uh, the sample size is 17,000 respondents, 170. And what was interesting about that data is we got a lot of protesters and non-protesters and what Gwendolyn and Sasa and I were interested in are what are the things driving willingness to protest, in fact. In Belarus, one of the main predictors of willingness to protest in Belarus in 2020 was being a Democrat and was wanting to join the EU. There's a very clear geopolitical element to this. And so that's where we first, and I first started to look at, is there in fact that connection between wanting to join the EU and democracy itself? And it is. It's massive, the effect in, in Belarus, and now we've confirmed that with other data that has been collected by other scholars. Um, it increases the likelihood by 24 percentage points. But here's the interesting thing. 
in Belarus and in Ukraine, we're able to ask questions about the existential threat that Russia also proposes. And when you add, do you believe that Russia poses a serious existential threat to your country as an indicator into your model, it actually slightly dampens the effect of being a Democrat. And it's strongly correlated and endogenous, in fact, to being one. So when you add those things into your model, and this is the same exact result we're getting in Ukraine today in the wartime context, being a Democrat still heightens the likelihood of an individual wanting to join the EU, in fact, by 18 percentage points, so going down from 24. That's a massive difference. Um, but uh, believing that Russia is the most significant to Belarus increases the likelihood of wanting to join the EU by 30 percentage points. It is about a micro-level calculus relating to values. It is also about a choice between different models of state-citizen relations, and as well as a threat geopolitically to these countries. These constituents, that's how they perceive it. <coughs> so, I think there are a few lessons here for us as scholars. Uh, it's For some people, it might seem still trite to talk about democratic values. I think we should take them more seriously, precisely because of the consistency of the findings across space and time is, I think, truly remarkable, as well as the magnitude of the effect. It's quite substantial, and it uh, is robust to a variety of robustness checks that I simply don't have the time to go into here. So EU normative power, I think, no, not only exists, but in fact it has endured in some of the places people did not expect it to at all. It may well be that the EU la EU's last remaining strength in the face of ongoing crises turmoil uh, is it's serving as a unifying force, and it's, uh, and it's serving as a unifying force between the Union and its <coughs> neighboring regions, is its democratic pull. So perhaps the EU, we have to learn a few lessons. The EU core liberal democratic values, they do serve as a compelling force that attracts citizens, not only in neighboring non-democratic or democratizing countries, but also inside the Union. The EU's democratic pull phenomenon has a tangible impact on democratization of neighboring non-democratic countries. In fact, it's directly connected to citizens' own engagement in mass protests, in elections, and so on and so forth. The influence of the EU's democratic values also plays a significant role in member states' decision to remain in the Union. And I think peace misjudged some things here in Poland, the party that just lost. Some of the discourse was teetering on the edge of this, and they were directly punished for around this. If you look at who switched votes in Poland, the story plays out. And I think there's not only a need for some empirical and analytical shifts in, in focus here, but policymakers and analysts really must evaluate their approaches to neighboring authoritarian na uh, uh, countries, such as Russia. Not only must they reevaluate how they approach Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and we can keep going, and how they understand citizens and their uh, desires in those countries, but really how they deal with their authoritarian neighbors that are presenting a competing model that is attractive to some and has won over some populations. <coughs> so I do think the misunderstanding of what drove ordinary citizens to want to stay or join uh, the EU, coupled with a willingness to accept perceived trade-offs of authoritarian appeasement for economic security, has contributed to actually perhaps not only, of course, but has contributed to the making of the greatest threat to EU security. Sadly, it took Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine to make this clear, make it clear that perhaps also Putin, as EU elites, and perhaps many scholars alike, failed to see that Ukrainians already saw themselves as European, 
because they saw themselves as Democrats. And only in accepting this will we fully understand why Ukrainians believe that they are fighting not only for their future in the European Union, but for the future of Europe and its unity, its peace and security. They are willing to die to be let in because of values that they think they share with the EU. It's about time the EU reflects on those values a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, all you, thank you uh, very much on, on behalf of the JCMS and my co-editors who are here as Gabriel Silasburg and Roberta Garina. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and delivering um, such, a, such a fascinating and a multifaceted uh, annual lecture. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we do have some time for um, questions and we do have uh, some roving mics as well. So perhaps we'll take um, two or three questions. If I could ask you um, to keep your questions quite brief, um, and also if you're able just to uh, introduce yourself as well, that would be um, wonderful. So um, first off, um, yeah, just there. Thank you. Bye. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Olga, for your contribution to Ukrainian studies. It was uh, very impressive research. Uh, very brief question. Uh, did you face uh, some limitations or difficulties in gathering uh, qualitative data from Belarus? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for now? Are we good? Yeah. Oh, David's got it. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Miriam Schuler. I'm a PhD student at KCL, and I was just wondering, when you say that the EU has a democratic pull factor, what exactly does dem democracy mean, and what democratic values do actually pull Ukrainians and Belarusians to, to Europe? Is it just elections? Is it freedom from corruption? Or does it go further, and does it include minority rights? Because especially if we look at Hungary and Poland, then we see the government claiming that they're paternalistically lectured about democracy and the rule of law, and they claim that their citizens' decision on what liberal values mean is undermined by the EU. And some scholars, as like Inge Larsen, say that when the Eastern states joined the Union, that was especially to be free from Russian influence and free from authoritarianism, but that democracy was not perceived as something that is guaranteed or imposed by the EU, but still interpreted by nation states. And so I was wondering, what democratic values are pulling Belarusians and Ukrainians to Europe? Do you want to take these two? First? Yeah, let's take these two. That's already a lot um, <laughs> of stuff in there. Uh, thank you. Those were brilliant questions. Um, difficulty of collecting quantitative data in um, Belarus. D difficulty of collecting any data in autocratic. Um, uh, context specifically when, when we're, we're collecting data on protest engagement uh, in the context where protesters are being very aggressively uh, not only physically beaten up but obviously taken on mass to prisons if everyone remembers the context of 2020 this was you know 7,000 arrests in, in the span of just a few days this was massive what was happening uh, it is difficult and I don't think, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, both are extremely difficult. And the only thing that we were very pleased about, I guess, when it came to the mobilized data, is that we were able to compare to um, colleagues who have uh, conducted surveys for longer periods of time in Belarus, predating also the protests, that we were getting similar types of populations and we were getting similar frequencies on some less controversial items. Uh, so that gave us a little bit of hope that the method that we selected, because it was a method that we had to select, it was still the middle of the pandemic, we couldn't, not only could we not, uh, we could not physically send individuals into the protests, ethically, our university would never allow us to do that in Belarus during a pandemic, right? So there, there are obviously serious mythological concerns there, but nonetheless, there are multiple studies that have seemed to show very similar things. Uh, and putting that all together, combining that with qualitative data, combining that with a variety of photographic audio and video data, which is available, combining that with scraping of Telegram, which our project also did, you get a very similar story. And when you get that multitude of different types of data confirming a similar story, it is still possible that in an authoritarian context, you're missing things. 
But if you keep doing it that way, and you can not even triangulate, but quadra whatever you're doing at this point, there's a good story to be told. And I think you have more and more confidence that you're telling the right story. On what values? So I was expecting the question, but what do ordinary citizens actually mean by democracy when we ask them about democracy? And then you have heads nodding, yes. Well, of course, that is a question that we as scholars take extremely seriously and revisit repeatedly in democracies and democratizing contexts. And it is in fact very possible that this is a shifting perception of just, just let's stick to what is democracy. That in, in the same country over time, citizens might have different perceptions of what democracy means. This is all possible. What we also do in our uh, survey um, at different points in time, not in every single survey, but we've done it at different uh, uh, points in time over the different projects we've conducted in Ukraine specifically, is we ask, what, do you, what does democracy mean to you? And it's like reading Catherine's paper about the narratives of, foundational narratives of the EU. Uh, economic stability is something in there. Uh, sometimes, not the main one, but it's, it's in there. Uh, rule of law, repeatedly. Um, so very institutionalist focused for ordinary citizens. The fact that citizens either engage or that the voice is being listened to is probably the dominant feature. It's obviously said in a variety of different ways. And that elites and then, of course, ordinary citizens will have different lexicon than we would, maybe, or maybe not. Uh, uh, they might say things like, politicians or elites listen to the people, um, elections matter, uh, people's voice matters, the elite can't simply decide whatever they want, they are guided by the people, right? So all these types of things. Some people will mention minority rights. Some people will mention equality for all. Right? Uh, and again, that's not maybe a dominant, but it is high up there. It is equally as high up there as rule of law. That's interesting. Again, the language that ordinary citizens might use is slightly different, but it's there. Now, in terms of the values that attract, here I think it's the argument I'm saying is that it's normatively what the EU represents. The practicalities of what happens in EU member states is much more complicated, and I, that's why I repeatedly said idealized perception of what the EU means and what its liberal democratic values are. The interesting thing is that the perception of that normative value is not only for those outside of it, but also inside of it. So Democrats in Poland that understand the very complexities of their own democracy are showing that same dynamic. And I checked this, by the way, with ESS data, and it, it, it holds. <laughs> so other countries, we can go into other countries. I just like to use my own data when I, when I, when I am doing my research here. So the perception of values and a normative understanding of them but they include the very same things, I think, that uh, the citizens themselves tell us. And that's what I really like to do in surveys because I am a mixed qual quant person. I do believe in in-depth language-based research and field immersion. Uh, I think it's very important for scholars not only to conduct focus groups in relation to their survey content and then reflect and change their surveys, if necessary, vis-a-vis -vis focus groups, but also to allow space for qualitative, open-ended answers on key things within surveys. I can tell you right now, when we ask the question about uh, civic engagement in the war effort in Ukraine, we ask the question as a multiple choice question. Are you donating funds? Are you volunteering? Are you participating in protest? Have you joined uh, the, the, the territorial defense? Have you joined the army? Social scientists, we came up with those. We have hard to say, refuse to answer, and we have other. Currently, it, it, it's dropped down, but in the first uh, times we surveyed Ukrainians in May 2022, that other, hundreds, hundreds of other options. 
So if we give space in quantitative surveys, we can get that. I'm arguing here that we need to do more of that. So we have to uncover this phenomenon a little bit further. We have to dig deeper. And then, of course, we have to confront with the issues about minority rights, not simply in Hungary and, and Poland or new member states, in the Baltics, the historical issues around this, including during a session and how it was a little bit of a turn a blind eye to certain things about passportization in relation to language capacity. But also in countries like France, like Germany, <coughs> elsewhere, where you have serious minority rights questions, right? So I don't think this is necessarily just, I just wanted to then. Thank you. And take another round of questions if there are some. So, hi. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Ben. I'm a postgraduate student here at King's. Um, I was wondering if you think that um, the results that show being pro-democracy uh, uh, means that you're pro-EU shows that the so-called democratic deficit um, concerns around the EU have begun to fade, or if you think it's just specific to uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, and Morocco? Thank you. It's an excellent question. I don't... Oh, sorry. I just no, went no, to jump. No, Is that okay? On. Carry on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, my instinct now is I don't think it's a simply these cases situation. Um, I wouldn't be presenting it as such. It, those who know me, I'm, I, I am very reluctant to say things that I don't think I'm quite confident in empirically. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a democratic deficit. That doesn't mean that there aren't problems with democracy at the EU level or at the member state level. Uh, or at the local level, in local politics. Uh, it's just interesting that the thing that really seems to be important for those true believers is this. And it makes sense. Maybe because they actually can't say they want us to be in the EU for simply economic equality and economic security, because that hasn't been so clear. Maybe because they can't say something else because that hasn't been so clear. So I don't know maybe what is producing this, but the true believers seem to think it's important. Um, the resilient believers. Also those who come to a pro-EU accession position. They do so only <coughs> after becoming supporters of democracy. That is an interesting dynamic, and that's something that only panel data allows us really to look at. And if, and what the cool thing is, by the way, the Mobilize Project, and I just haven't been able to look at this, we conducted focus groups that are panel focus groups with people um, uh, both in Ukraine, but also reside, Ukrainians residing in the EU. So there's other dynamics discursively that we could unfold here and other empirical work. Um, but it, it's, it's, it, I think it's a broader um, conversation. Any questions? Okay, I mean, if, for one final thing, I, I just wondered whether, and it's going back to our theme of European integration, um, do you think there would be a difference if in the questions, instead of saying, you know, the, the, the average living standard in the EU, if you said instead of Western Europe, so not specifically about the EU as a, as a polity, then the dip, there might be a difference? Or, and I suppose what I'm getting at is, do people understand what being in the EU mean, or is it we want to be part of this, this sort of geographical um, uh, space rather than a deep knowledge of, oh, this is what it actually entails? That's an, that's an excellent question. What is the EU to Ukrainians? What is the EU to Moroccans? And what is the EU to Belarusians? And it could be that for those different populations, those things mean something different. Um, and, but we have asked these questions in the past uh, in our research, certainly in the countries that I focus on most, and certainly in Ukraine. And people will tell you, Niemechina, uh, Germania, Germany, right? That is this ideal country in the EU. I think maybe some Germans would like that. Uh, but they are not thinking of Germany when they are thinking of their road to the EU. They're thinking of Poland. Poland is the model that they are emulating. Poland is the, actually the, we want to be like Poles and be able to live in Germany. <laughs> but it's the Polish model that becomes the focal point. 
uh, perhaps to the annoyance of the Germans. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Have we got another question? Sorry. Oh, Takis, please. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to prolong this. Thank you very much for the talk. It was, was, was excellent. Um, really brilliant. I'm uh, very grateful. I, I wonder where do you think Brexit might fit into this? Because if one thinks that uh, if, if being a Democrat is a kind of self certification, as it were, and this question was posed to um, the supporters of Brexit, I, I doubt if they would say we are less democrat, that's why we, we want to be outside the union. It, it, it's just a thought, and of course the, the historical context is quite different, but it seems to me, the op and I'm really thinking aloud, you know much more, but I would have thought it would be the, the opposite. If, if you ask those who are in favor of, of staying in Europe, in the UK, they would also say they're, they're more democrats. So both groups, I would have thought, w w would, would fall into the, um, uh, uh, the pro-democracy self-certification. Th thank you. So actually, brilliant question. Slides I did not include. <laughs> um, uh, and actually something that I would like to study with my colleagues at the University of Manchester run the British election study, and we're talking about doing this exactly. So. Just looking at the case of Poland as an example of a country still in, with backsliding and complexity, uh, with also a serious segment of the population that feels they are not treated equally economically speaking, uh, that they are deprived more because of certain things, and sometimes perception is because of the EU, and whether that is economic or also sometimes cultural, Right, that the EU imposes certain things on us that we would like to have greater control at the national unit. Uh, when you flip actually the question and you see who wants to leave the EU, which is the question we also have, it's the economic deprivation factors and the cultural factors such as not believing in equal rights for women, not wanting to have abortion, coupled with economic deprivation. Uh, at the micro level, that is a, 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 a statistically significant driver of wanting to leave. And I think that even though rhetorically, in for instance a referendum campaign, there's a talk of, uh, what was it, more control, what was it, the, I don't see, I blocked it out. <laughs> Take back control. Take back control, thank you. Take back control, which seems like a, democratic message, the things that at the micro level at least seem to be driving also those voters for to leave were similar. It wasn't that they weren't necessarily Democrats, although you can actually make an argument that those who hold pro-authoritarian views are actually more susceptible to Eurosceptic views, and this is, plays out in a variety of member states currently. Um, but it is that those other factors are much more important, even controlling for whether or not they are Democrats. But in the other case, it is the de being a Democrat that is the most important thing in driving wanting to stay in. And so it's how do you speak to those individuals in a way that is very tricky because they don't feel they're being served democratically by the context, or at least that is the discourse that they have been both told and then truly believe themselves. Right? So that's the tricky bit. But it, it, the, the relationship, I think, would hold. So we've tried to run this a little bit with some colleagues. And stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Work for the future. Well, uh, yeah, for you. Uh, thank you very oh, much for, you. <laughs> uh, for, for being here this evening. And thank you to, to everybody uh, for coming. We do have a uh, drinks reception at the, uh, at the back of the hall. So if you'd like to make your way over there, uh, then we've got uh, further time for, uh, for discussion. So thank you very much once again. Thank you.